the coast. Prior to the ground assault, the army's maneuver divisions pulled up stakes at their bases in northern Saudi Arabia and began their trek to start points at the border. The army attack began with a feint by the 1st Cavalry Division to divert Iraqi attention from the main blow further west. Simultaneously, the 18th Airborne Corps, including the French Daguet Force, drove north to seal off the left flank from any Iraqi reinforcements. The British 1st Armoured Division attacked along the Wadi El Batin, then swung towards Kuwait to eliminate Iraqi tank forces. The heaviest blow was delivered by the U.S. Army's 7th Corps, which headed north before hooking to the east to confront the Republican Guard. G-Day, Sunday the 24th of February, was preceded by an intense artillery barrage against Iraqi positions. If any branch of the Iraqi armed forces remained of concern, it was the artillery. Not only were there a great many Iraqi artillery pieces, but they were the only weapons capable of making concerted use of chemical weapons. They were a prime target of Allied air power and counter-battery fire. The increased tempo of the artillery bombardments foreshadowed the final land attack. o'clock in the morning, the Marines, the 1st Marine Division and the 2nd Marine Division launched attacks through the barrier system. They were accompanied by the 2nd, uh, uh, the Tiger Brigade, U.S. Army Tiger Brigade of the 2nd Armored Division. At the same time, over here, two Saudi task forces also launched a penetration through this barrier. But while they were doing that, at 4 o'clock in the morning over here, the 6th French Armored Division accompanied by a brigade of the 82nd Airborne, also launched an overland attack to their objective up in this area, al Farman Airfield. And we were held up a little bit by the weather, but uh, by 8 o'clock in the morning, the 101st Airborne Air Assault launched an air assault deep in the enemy's territory to establish a forward operating base in this location right here. U.S. Marine forces began to penetrate the first layers of Iraqi defensive positions and minefields before the main attack G-Day, Sunday, 24th of February, infiltrating through the first set of barriers and minefields under the cover of darkness. G-Day began overcast, cold and rainy. The French Daguet force, the westernmost element of the attack, began its drive on the Az Salman airbase. A brief tank battle took place on the approaches to the airbase. After overrunning Az Sulman Air Base, the Dargay force headed north to the Euphrates River to seal the Iraqi troops in the Kuwait theater. The door would soon be shut, preventing Iraqi reinforcements from arriving and preventing the escape of Iraqi forces westward. In the meantime, the 101st Air Assault Division began their airlift operation deep into Iraq. They established a forward airfield called Cobra Base, from which to stage future air assaults towards the Euphrates River. The helicopter operation was the largest on record, including not only troop transport aircraft, but the larger Chinook helicopters, carrying additional fuel, vehicles and artillery. Hours later, the 101st cleared out bunkers in the Cobra base area 
and brought other Iraqi forces under artillery fire. I can't conceive of another division in the Army or in the world that could uh, do what this air assault division has done this morning, move us all this uh, people and equipment, uh, rapidly put it on the ground. We have secured uh, uh, a large area of Iraq in his own heartland, and uh, we're prepared very shortly uh, for the division commander to start pushing other people through here. We're going to advance from here, then? Absolutely. There's nothing, as you can well see, there ain't nothing to hold out here. So uh, this is a way station for future operations, and that's, uh, that's what we'll do. Operating out of Cobra Base, Apache attack helicopters swarmed forward, attacking Iraqi tank formations with their precision-guided Hellfire missiles. The 7th Corps attack came next. Preceded by the Armored Cavalry Regiments, the tank and mechanized divisions began their drive into Iraq. During the first day of fighting, contact with Iraqi units was light, and it was apparent that Iraqi resistance would be much weaker than had been expected. Later that day, the British 1st Armored Division swung back eastward to engage Iraqi armored divisions near the Kuwait border. In the ensuing encounters, over 200 Iraqi tanks and 100 other armored vehicles were destroyed with very light losses to British forces. I expected them to fight harder than they did and, uh, and we were prepared for that. And as we were talking earlier, if they had stayed in every single bunker and fought out of every bunker, the result would have been the same. They still would have been lost, would have lost. Uh, our casualties would have been higher, so uh, thank God that didn't happen. My view is that uh, their heart just wasn't in it. Uh, POWs have, have said this, uh, deserters told us this early on. Uh, we don't know why we're here. We don't know why we invaded Kuwait. Many, many of them said we think it's wrong that we invaded Kuwait. So with that kind of psychology uh, and with a force like we had coming down on them, uh, where it was certain that they were going to die, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't lend itself to uh, to a force having a really uh, tough desire to, to hang in there and to to uh, to defend. After weeks of aerial bombardment, only a few Iraqi units still had the stomach for a fight. The Iraqi Fifth Mechanized Division, which had fought at Kafji, tried to resist the Marine attack. Some did fight. Uh, we had a, quite a counterattack yesterday morning, and uh, a good bit of it around my CP. Uh, the 5th Mech Division counterattack. Uh, we did a couple things, I think, that disrupted it. Uh, we learned where they were assembling and fired artillery uh, right at their assembly points, which flushed them out of the oil fields. And one thing we were surprised that they were operating in those oil fields with the hot fires. And that's really where they came at us. The largest tank battles took place on the 26th and 27th of February when the 7th Corps encountered Republican Guard divisions. Few visual records of these battles exist as they took place in poor weather or at night. The battles were extremely one-sided. The U.S. Abrams tanks were able to stand off at long range, destroying Iraqi tanks before the Iraqi tanks were capable of hitting them. Seven Abrams tanks were hit by Iraqi T-72 tanks, but none of the Iraqi rounds could get through the Abrams' tough armor. One of the most savage battles pitted a troop from the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment in a night-long engagement against retreating elements of two Republican Guard divisions. By morning, the Iraqi force had been completely defeated. The Republican Guard divisions were defeated nearly as quickly as the regular army divisions. With few exceptions, the Republican Guard divisional commanders had abandoned their troops to their own fate, leaving the units leaderless and uncoordinated. 
Some of the most intense fighting in Kuwait came in the approaches to Kuwait City Airport. A tank battle broke out between Marine tanks and Iraqi armored units. The battle was as one-sided as the Army's tank battles, as is evident from this wreckage of the Iraqi tanks on the battlefield. Check it out. What do you call that? What hit it was a stable round. Went in here and just, when it goes inside, it fragments and just basically blows up all inside. It's just burning here. There's nothing but rubble in here. There's no way anybody could live in this. It's torn to pieces. Looks like somebody threw a frag in here. It's still warm. It's The two Marine divisions destroyed or captured 14 Iraqi divisions in their drive towards Kuwait City. Allied casualties were remarkably light through most of the fighting. The honor of taking the city was given to Kuwaiti and Saudi army units. As Kuwait City was being liberated, the Tiger Brigade, an army tank unit providing support to the Marines, pressed ahead to cut off Iraqi forces retreating back towards Iraq. The road from Kuwait City to Basra became a virtual highway of death as Iraqi forces were smashed by tank fire and airstrikes. After four days of fighting, President Bush ordered a ceasefire. The strategic objectives of Operation Desert Storm the liberation of Kuwait and the reduction of the Iraqi army's strength were complete. And as president, I can report to the nation, aggression is defeated, the war is over. Without a doubt, air power played an important role in the conflict, but air power by itself was not enough. The swiftly executed ground campaign by coalition forces secured the defeat of the Iraqi army occupying Kuwait. Uh, air power played uh, a, a very, very important role. I think it had a lot to do with their morale being extremely low. Uh, air power had, uh, had, had made logistics uh, and resupply very difficult for them, so they were hungry and thirsty, as you saw as you moved along uh, with, uh, with one of our task forces. On the other hand, there were still a hell of a lot of them here, alive and well. So <clears throat> the bottom line is, you still got to come in and, and clean it up. Uh, and in this case, the cleanup uh, didn't turn out to be uh, the huge fight that we anticipated. The Gulf War was one of the most striking victories in modern land combat. The Iraqi army, though large and well-equipped, had in the end proven to be a brittle, hollow army. In contrast, decades of training and the deployment of superior weaponry by coalition forces proved too much for Iraqi forces stuck in a featureless desert with nowhere to hide. <laughs> 